Hey everyone! So today this presentation is going to be on the Kunzari language, which is a it's a very interesting language and it's a very um, it's one of the lesser known languages of the world. I, as a matter of fact, had no idea that this language even existed until literally just a couple months ago. Somebody uh, I saw somebody shared it on my Twitter timeline and I became fascinated with it um, because it kind of reminds me of Maltese's um, of Maltese because of its mixed nature. So uh, this language has uh, a fascinating history. So that's what we'll be going through today. So where is the Kumzari language spoken today? So the Kumzari language is spoken by about roughly 5,000 people, and that's like probably at the very most. Um, it is spoken in the mostly in the Munsandam Peninsula in modern-day northern Oman. And it is the northernmost point of Oman, looking at the map from their perspective. And if you look at this map, so you have the Strait of Hormuz. If you go down that first town at the very head of the peninsula called Kumza or Kumzar, that is basically the stronghold of the language today, the modern stronghold um, outside of the, the island of Larak. If you go down on the left side or, yeah, or the west end, you see Kaba, Rasa, and then you see Hasab. Um, and Hasab, that is also a, a well-known place where the language is spoken. In the town of Hasab, there is a there is a Kumzari quarter where the language is still spoken, and they actually have their own section of the town's souk where they where they sell some things. And if you go on the right side, you see Shisa, Film, Lima. Uh, and then you see Oman, Munsandam, and down there you see Diba El Fujaira. And that was a, a one of the main market towns of the Sasanian and pars possibly the Parthian Empire, uh, which were ancient Persian empires because uh, the ancient empire of Persia did control many parts of the eastern seaboard of the Arabian Peninsula. There are also two other towns called Damset Yerd or Damset Yerd. And Nizwa, which are further southeast of Fujairo, which are they're mostly in the mountains. And I don't know if the language is spoken there at all anymore. I don't think it is. And then the island of Larak. So if you see this arrow right about right above where it says the Strait of Hormuz, this island right here is the island of Larak, which is considered a, a part of modern day Iran. And uh, and on that island, the Laraki variety is spoken there, and that. That variety of Kumzari is a little bit different, which we will get into a little bit later in the video. So I need to provide a little bit of history for this language because it's just kind of interesting that this language is the only Indo-Iranian language exclusive to the Iranian Peninsula. So there's going to need to be a little bit of context about how an, how an, how an Iranian language got to the the Arabian Peninsula in the first place when there are no other ones, to my knowledge, that are on the Arabian Peninsula. So, in ancient times, the Persians or Iranians, they ruled the Mutsandam Peninsula, and uh, a great swath of it, um, of what is now modern Oman, at least the northern parts, and uh, it's generally accepted by most linguists that the Kumzari language has been spoken in the Arabian Peninsula, um, or at least what was known in ancient times as Maka or Makan. There are also other names that, like Mikoi in ancient Greek or something like that, or Mikai, um, since at least the 7th century. And some, uh, some believe it may have been spoken even before pre-Islamic times. And generally it's unknown exactly when the language emerged there, but it is known that the Sasanians did have market towns, as I mentioned earlier, in the town of Deba, which was one of the main Kumzari towns uh, historically. And there were others around the southeastern tip of the peninsula. The, um, it's known that these towns flourished with trade between the 3rd and the 7th centuries. So this is the time period for which Kumzari um, at least appears to have been spoken or formed. There, because it's been there since at least seventh century, the Sasanian Empire was there in the seventh century, so it makes sense that whoever spoke the language got there at that time. So, in a little bit more history, just so you can understand how how the language is still there today. So, at in the town of Damsetjerd, 
uh, which historically was another Kumzari town, which is further southeast of Deba. The reason why most merchants went to Deba was because the waters were a little bit calmer in Deba. Whereas if you were to sail around in and enter the Strait of Hormuz, the waters get kind of, uh, they, they become very rough. The sea becomes rough and unpredictable weather happens. So nobody really went, like very few people would venture that far into uh, into the channel or the street, I mean. So there was a castle, which I believe, which I'm assuming is uh, where some ancient Sassanian royalty lived. And there was also a fort at Damset Jared, uh, which was there to protect the trade that was coming into Mu the Musandam Peninsula. And there in the, the community on Larak in uh, Iran today has about, I think it has about 500 speakers, if I'm not mistaken. And so in the, in the middle part of the 7th century, the Iranians, or rather the Sassanian Iranians, were driven out of the Sassanian control regions. And uh, just to, a, a long story short, there's it's a very long story, but it's a fascinating, you can check this out in the Von der Anombi's work on her, on the section in the history of the Kumzari language, if you want to read the entire story. Uh, but just to make a long story short, there it was demanded. So after Prophet Muhammad died, uh, Islam's prophet uh, passed away. There were some there were some events that transpired, and they basically asked the par the Persians who were left to pay taxes. I'm not sure if this is zakat or some other type of taxes, uh, and they refused to pay those taxes. So they they went away, and I believe also some Shihi uh, Arabs also uh, went with them. And they in the mountainous terrain of the Munsanna Mountains provided the perfect conditions for the Kundari language to be preserved and to keep on evolving. Uh, it, uh, let me just add some notes here. So, uh, according to Anombi, McWhorter, Doctor McWhorter, I believe he is a linguist at Columbia University. He he said that during those uh, during these times that Aramaic was oftentimes the language used in court, and that there would be there would be scribes who would be writing things in the local language or in some form of Persian. And so because all this stuff was going on, especially in the in the Sassanian controlled empire in on the uh, the eastern seaboard of the Arabian Peninsula, that this provided the conditions for a mixed language to come about. So that's just an, an extra note as to where the language may have started forming from. So uh, Van der, Van der Val Anombi provides a perfect description in their work, on uh, which is mostly what this presentation is based on, uh, their their grammar of the language. But I will read it here because this was there is nothing better that can describe the language. For practical reasons, they incorporated foreign terminology for their social and economic advantage: Hindi and Baluchi for maritime trade, Portuguese for sailing, English for pearling and oil. Gulf Arabic for fishing, and Omani Arabic for politics and government work. In Kumzari, these languages were overlaid on a substrate of both Middle Persian and Arabian structures. Fascinating. Fascinating description here. So, which languages has Kumzari integrated into its vocabulary? Well, tons. Just to just keep it short. Including English. Because of its history being where it's at, as the opening of the Strait of Hormuz, of the Strait of Hormuz, many European powers have gone there. Uh, Arabs have gone there. Swahili, Swahili traders, Sokotri, even Sokotri traders. Which it's a very, it's a pretty isolated island. So the fact that they got their word for if or when, which is ka, from the Sokotri language, which you can see on the left side, it is the fourth word from the bottom. That is insanely fascinating. And then they have languages from. They have borrowings from South Semitic languages such as Jibali and Mehri, languages which are all which are very, very in danger today. Some of them may even be dormant now. And there are there are words from Shihi Arabic, which is the main type of Arabic spoken in that region. There are languages from Parthian Avestan. I'm not sure where there's where those are spoken. Obviously, there uh, there are words from Middle Persian because the form of Persian that Kumzari mainly consists of is Middle Persian. There were also uh, many terms from Portuguese because the Portuguese controlled parts of Oman in the 16th, the 15th and 16th centuries or one of those centuries or part of one of those centuries. 
And also Baluchi, which is kind of far away. There's stuff from Hindi. There's stuff from Urdu. There's stuff from Turkish, Minabi. I don't know where Minabi is spoken. There are things from Ludi, Kurdish, and Himyaritic, which I, I don't know where um, Himyaritic sp languages are spoken. But that is just fascinating. There are all kinds of words from all around their known trade world. Things going from all the way into East Africa to the middle of the Indian Ocean, all the way to India. That That is just fascinating to me. So I just wanted to give an example of the a comparison between Kumzari and modern Farsi because whenever people talk about Indo-Iranian languages, usually Farsi is the first thing that comes to mind, Farsi Dari or Tajiki because those are the main varieties spoken today, at least as national languages. So I just wanted to give an example of how far it has diverged. And I thought numbers would be a good way to show that because numbers typically are one of the things that they don't really change that much generally in a language. So if you, so zero is the same in both modern Persian, Farsi, and Kunzari. It comes from the Arabic word for zero. And uh, and the word for one, it's, you know, the only difference is a vowel change from a to e, or from e to a, I mean, or not sure it may, you know, it's modern Persian has continued evolving away from Middle Persian. So who knows? I don't know what, I don't know anything about Middle Persian. Two looks to be the same. Three has a, shy, a slight vowel change. Four is interesting because there's a there's an extra there there's a har there there and there is no ha sound in most Kumasari varieties. Five is the same. Six is almost the same. Seven is almost the same minus the h I mentioned earlier. Same with eight. Nine has a slight vowel change and there's an additional h in Farsi. The word for 10 ha is basically the same. It's written the same, but Farsi has an H at the end. The 100 is almost the same uh, with the, there's an emphatic T in the Kumzari version, and there's just, it's just a D in Farsi. 1000 is the, is the same. So in Kumzari, the, like I said, the H has changed to either a glottal stop or it's completely disappeared. And 100,000 in Kumzari is this word, like. I, I have no idea where this word came from, but in Farsi, as far as my research, if, if if there's a version used in Farsi or one of the Farsi dialects, please mention that below in the comments. I'm not sure where this, what language this comes from, but it may have been part of one of its borrowings. So just some extra notes on Kunzari before we get into the features of the language. So every single dialect of the Kunzari language, except Insular Kunzari, also known as Laraki, nobody calls it insular Kumzari, that's just a term that I've um, that I've uh, made. Have glottalized what is the ha in Persian and the ch has has evolved to ch. And as per Anombi in their work on the Kumzari language, which I will post in the description for so that you can go and see it. It's publicly available for everyone to go see um, through through a Dutch university. There is currently a dictionary um, in progress as of 2009. That, that dictionary may have been complete, but I was not able to find it. And Kumzari speakers are typically traditionally endogamous, meaning that they usually, that they marry within their own speech communities. In the town of Hossab, shown on the map at the beginning of the video, Kumzari speakers have been known to marry other Shihi Arabs because they have lived side by side with Shihi Arabs. Um, in that town and other towns in the region where it may have been spoken in the Munsandam Peninsula. It is said that their closest relative is the Luri language, which I believe is spoken in southwestern Iran. I am not sure about that. I did not research the, the Luri language during the research for this video. But, the, but it is known that both languages have resemblances to Middle Persian. So on to grammar. Decided to be a little bit silly and put the Japanese characters here for it and the Spanish word. <laughs> so syntax, a.k.a. sentence order. So typically in Kumzari, the sentence order is subject, object, verb. But this can vary depending on the structure of the sentence and how that changes. So in the first example here, which means the big ship arrived before morning, we have the first word here, which is the word for ship. And there is, um, in Farsi, I do not think that there is a definite article, or at least not officially, 
There may, I believe there is an indefinite article. In Kumzari, there is both an indefinite and an indefinite article. So this indefinite article, which I think is used a little bit more than English um, in some contexts, um, is this long O vowel. And uh, the next word here is the adjective for big, followed by another indefinite article, I believe, at least according to Thomas in his 1930 work on the Kumzari language. And then you have the word for before, which I believe is a an Iranian word. You have this word, this Arabic derived word for morning, uh, sabah, and then uh, this word that looks like Hamid, meaning arrived. So in so one thing you will notice, as I mentioned earlier in the video, this is this language is known for its mixed, its mixed nature and its mixed structure. So both the grammar and the vocabulary is heavily mixed. So it is about forty four percent Persian. About 34% Arabic, and the rest of the language is just different. It's from different sources. So you, you will see sentences like this where you see, you know, the Arabic word, an Arabic word here, mostly, mostly in the Iranian vocabulary. And I will show you two examples that demonstrate this even better. So the next sentence, uh, the word for master sorcerer, followed by the definite article O. And then you have a word which means like this, incha, cholt, which is the uh, the verb to go in the third in the third person singular in the imperfective form. And then you have the uh, the subject here, something to mark the subject, I believe. And then an Arabic word meaning advancing, qadama. And then uh, this reflexive word, which uh, we will actually talk about later in the pronoun section. It's a it's an interesting word. Uh, whole, and then the verb to do in the imperfective in the third person singular form. Then you have the preposition to and the third person singular form, which is generally added after verbs or used as pronouns. And then in the third sentence here, who is the one who has opened the door? So you have this word here, key, and then a word which can mean that, which, or who. It's uh, I forget the word for this uh, relative relative pronoun. I'm, I'm not exactly sure I forget the word here. And then the word for door, which is an Indo-Iranian word. This only relates to the English word for door and the de the definite article again. And then you have the verb to open in the perfective, which we'll be we'll talk about uh, different we'll talk about different aspects of verbs of Kumzari verbs later in the video here. And then you have that marked with the third person singular form. And then you have a, which is an interrogative. Uh, an interrogative clinic or suffix which is used to ask questions. So the syntax can change. The word order typically changes when something comes up somewhere or when you're talking about there, uh, there are or there is clauses. So in the first example here, we have uh, peak. I have to go back <laughs> into the grammar reference and look that up because I forgot to I was going to make a list of words of, of a different of the key, the grammar key that they use to mark uh, different parts of the sentence. I forgot to make that before this video because I was just excited to make it. And then you have the verb, the verb to come in the mirative form. So the mirative, we will be talking about that later, but it's basically used to, to describe something that is surprising or unexpected. Like suddenly there was this girl coming up. So that's why the mirative form is used here, which usually doesn't have an ending. And then uh, a word which means uh, word. So I guess it's the word in the word forward or backward, uh, that word. So, and then you have the word, and then you have the preposition up, the word for girl, which I believe may have a vowel after this in its base form. Um, and then the definite article. And then the next sentence we have, so this is an interesting way of saying there was. I'm not sure if the verb raf. I know reft is. Uh, I saw this in Thomas's work in a different sense that he that he made, but I'm, this is a very interesting way of expressing that there is something, and so this this verb raf means to go, and then you have the word for you have the word for boy, and then you have the indefinite article after that, meaning there was a boy. So post verbal negation. So post-verbal negation is a very interesting 
uh, it's a very interesting feature of the Kunzari language because it's it's rather unique. And it's not really known it's not really known to be used in Indo-Iranian languages. And uh, and I, having studied Maltese, which is um, a Neo-Arabic variety, um, or rather one of the some people consider the dialect. It's known to be a language by a distinct language by linguists. But having studied having studied that language for over a decade now. There, even in that one and all of the every single Arabic variety I've ever studied, there are no, there are no post-verbal negation or post-verbal negative forms that I know of. So this is rather interesting. And usually, na, which is the negative particle, is put at the end. So in this, so in these two sample sentences, the first one, the mother did not become blind. So here you have the word for mother, and then you have the definite article, and then after that you have the adjective for blind, and then you have the verb to become in the third person singular in the relive, which is one of the forms um, of kumsari verbs, which we will discuss later in the video, and then you have the negative particle. So in the second, in the second example, you have the word for husband, shu, and then you have the verb to want in the imperfective form, and then you have the first person singular attached to that, and then you have the negative. So this this particle, it's just na. In every example I've seen, it's just na. There are no different forms like in Old English for different for different subjects, or rather different pronouns. And it's just it's just interesting that the, that the, that there is. But there's even something even more interesting than this with um, in reference to negation. This can be this can actually be done in a double negative sense. So I don't know really any language that has this. It, I guess it would be like in English you can't really say like I don't have I don't have anything, right? Some people might say like I don't have nothing. You know, and you know, th th this is the only way that I can express it. I know some languages like some Spanish dialects or just in general Spanish, you can you can use double negatives like this. But this is a little bit more interesting because they're using the negative after a subject, at least in the one example that I uh, that I decided to use for this. So in this sentence, it means I sold the fish to you. I did not sell the pearl to you. So the first word we have here is fish. And then we have the definite article. And then we have the word foshnish, um, foshnis. Uh, the verb to sell in the perfective form, which is, again, another form, another verb form of kumzari, which we'll discuss later in the video. And then we have the first person singular ending here. And then we have the preposition ba, which means to. And then you have the second person plural, shma. And then you have the word for pearl, followed by the definite article, again, you have the same verb used in the first clause of the sentence to sell in its perfected form, followed by the first person singular. And then you have ba again, and then you have the second person plural here because they're telling that person that that they didn't sell that they, they, they didn't sell the pearl to you. And then so you have the the negative here after the verb foshnis. So foshnisum naba shma na. So you have so they're saying after shma which means y'all, they're putting this negative there again. So I'm assuming that because they're saying, I sold a fish to you. I did not sell the pearl to you to emphasize the fact that, that they didn't sell the pearl to them and it was just a fish. They had to put this after shma because it's, maybe it's something, it's like saying, I, I, did, I did not sell the pearl to you. And it's kind of interesting because the Kumzari language actually has emphatic emphatic versions of their pronouns, which, we, which we'll discuss here. So here, so here you go. So Kumzari has a set. So this was not found in Anombi's work. At least I didn't see it whenever I looked, whenever I looked at the section, maybe it's there and I just overlooked it. I have no idea. However, uh, it, in Thomas's work, which was written in 1930, almost 100 years ago, 93 years ago to be exact, there are there uh, there were forms given by his informants, and these forms are longer. They appear to be they appear to be 
more formal or rather lesser used. And then he and then his informants provided him with common pronouns or common versions of those pronouns, which are also the ones used in Anombi's work. So the ones in the middle, that's what most Kumzari speakers are going to be using today. And the ones on the left, you know, if you just want to sound like Shakespeare or <laughs> if you just want to be funny, I don't know when these are used or if you just want to, you know, if you want to emphasize them. I have no idea when this is used or how it's used. Uh, Thomas didn't really provide much information there. But there are uh, – but the common – the common set of suffixes are also used as the possessives, which is why I put the dash and the the tilde to to express that it's just the same forms. So, and you would attach those after a noun to say my this, your that, his this, our that, blah blah. blah. And then you have a set of emphatic, uh, which uh, this is also used in this is also uh there are this also exists in Cape Verde and Creole, you know, when you say like Ami, Abo, and stuff like that. So this is basically like saying in English, I was the one who did that, or it was me who did that. So whenever you emphasize something in English kind of like that, like it was him who built the pyramids. When you do that, that's basically the equivalent of what an emphatic pronoun is so you have ume ito ie and according to anombi there are no attested versions or rather this does not exist in the plural at all so more information about the pronouns so here we're going to go through the uh the possessives or rather examples of how it's used so this first example provided by thomas kafileme my caravan and in in the first person plural, brarma, provided by Anombi, and then another version provided by Thomas, sur sur to, your dog, and then you have haiwan shma, your animal, and then the third person singular, paran ye, or paran ye, its feathers, and the third person plural, hawi shan their courtyard so in this darker yellow i have marked the possessive pronouns so that you could get an idea of where those are and how they compare to english and then i've marked the words in various colors because that's what i generally do with different nouns so interestingly enough i found this kind of interesting because in most languages you would at least most languages i've studied you would either use the word for own followed by some kind of suffix expressing the the pronoun in that given form. So like you might say own followed by the first person uh, this or you, or you just say the equivalent of my own. However, in Kumzari, you do not – you you do not even bother using the possessive pronoun like at all. So ho, which is the reflexive – Saying, you know, I washed myself, I, I, you know, he, he did it himself, stuff like that. So re reflexive, uh, or, you know, lavarse, you know, those reflexive verbs in Spanish type of deal. So using the possessive noun plus own, whenever you do something like this, it does, it, it doesn't, it doesn't allow for it. So even if you're not saying own, you're just saying, you're not even saying own. You just say that you did something. You did something with your something, right? So I washed my car. You would basically say, I washed own car. You know, I washed a self car. That's basically what you would be saying when you're expressing this, right? So in the example here, so to say he lifted it over his head, it would be the equivalent of own head. You know, bizarre. Isn't, isn't that pretty bizarre? I mean, I think it's bizarre. <laughs> so if you have here, you say, Saye balatar. Pisar ho, and you, and and that's the correct form. You would not say saye balatar pisar ye. You would not you would not say that. So I've marked own and ye here in red to show you that they're wrong, and I've marked his and ho in the green as well as the reflexive form here to show that that is the correct one, and and to give you the example of its equivalent in the English language. So verbs. So, D verbs, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the video, D verbs are um, 
that's in mul- that's basically in every single Arabic variety or Neo Arabic variety. Uh, but in the Kumzari language, there are six forms, and there are conjugations for the first, second, and third person singular and plural forms as well that come after that, which I'm not going to discuss in this video. You can see that um, in Anomdi's work. Um, I assume they're pretty similar to Persian or, or rather to modern day Farsi. I have no idea. I don't. I've I've only studied a tiny little bit of of Farsi in the past, so I'm I'm not really familiar with the language. But what I can tell you, and all of this is all of this is from Anombi, so these are either these are either direct quotes or they are uh, generalizations of what they said in their work. So the realis is the first form, which is basically an event that is definitely certainly complete, or it will be completed for sure. So this generally takes the suffix d at you know, after the stem of the verb, before the conjugation. So in this example, uh, burwa, dum, I ran. And then you have the perfect form, which, which, uh, this is, uh, I forgot to write, oh my God, I forgot to write the form here. Oh, well. So in this form, so the, the perfect form here, it, 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 it generally is something that you have done already. So this is very similar to per the perfective form in uh, Slavic verbs in Slavic uh, languages such as Russian, which is like something that is something that is, you know, that has been done like a one time thing and imperfect, which is like I said, it's very like I said, for the perfect uh, for the perfect form, it's very similar to the imperfect form. Uh, it's it's also used for ongoing and complete for general statements intended or unrealized future plans etc so for perfect you have the suffix s which is used after the verb stem and before the conjugation and the imperfect you have or sorry the imperfect you have a it's kind of a little bit different here you have a prefix which goes before the verb and so in the example here, I'm not. I, I I would have to go back and look here. This is a, probably something I overlooked. Uh, this will, this is one of the last sections I edited for the video. So tambar um tam tambar. This is I load. I'm I'm not sure if it's tambarum. Um is the the first person singular conjugation for verbs. But all I can say is that there is a prefix t for the imperfect form. And then you have imperative commands, which they can be commands, they can be orders, they can be requests, they can be polite requests, they can be wishes for something to be done. So this is so this generally just takes the base form of the verb. So I've just provided a whole sentence here. Ana sai kush ho, perhaps lift it to your own lap. So sai here means to lift. Ana means perhaps. Kush means lap. And whole means your, or rather own, in the context of trying to understand it from the English language. And then we have a couple of weird, uh, a couple of uh, weird ones, uh, especially the narrative one. Irrealis expresses uncertainty, something that may theor- that may theoretically or hypothetically happen, something that may potentially happen, conditionally happen, or if it's uncertain to happen. So this is kind of kind of reminds me of the subjective form in Spanish or Portuguese where you where it may you know if 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 it would you know it, it may it may happen it could happen may not you're not just it just isn't certain to happen. So uh in this you also use what appears to be the base form, which is why I put a question mark here because I'm not exactly sure here. Um, I, I, the only thing I saw here was I saw a verb with irrealis using her, which is which means to buy, and then it, and then there was a sentence after it that used that used that was in the imperfect form and it just had the to in front. So I'm assuming that her, that her is that means that means to buy. And this appears to be an Indo-Iranian root. It may, be, I mean, shiri, yeah, shira, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it appears to be. It, it could. It appears to be. Uh, it might be. It might be Arabic. I'm not 100 percent sure about this one, but, but, um, but karimi, which one? And then her, um, her, because it's in the irrealis has should attached to it, and then um means I and I buy, and then her 
is by. And then the last verb form is the mirative form, which is something that expresses unexpected or something surprising. So this takes no form, which I guess is just the base form. And so in the example here, I have, he turned all 12 of them into stone. He turned all 12 of them into stone. So, are the boss the cas on Sean Bar King. So this is, it's just simple. There's not really anything else to say about the mirative. Um, this, there is a, there is the only example I can come up with this in different languages. Korean has a, what do they call the copula? It has a copula, which is, which is attached to something that is surprising. And I believe they have another one for unexpected things too. So D verbs. So D verbs, are just like post, neg, uh, post verbal negation, this is another one that's, uh, it's rather, it's rather unique. Um, just because it's a, it's not a Semitic language. It's simply a, it's simply a mixed Indo. It's a, and it's a language. It's been classified as Indo-Iranian because its substrate, its substratum is Indo-Iranian. Substratum meaning it's, it's the existing base, the what was first there, before it took on other things. That that part of the language is, is mostly Indo-Iranian. But then you, but because it's been, it's they, these people have been living side by side with the Shihi Arabs. They've been living in Oman. They're right next to the United Arab Emirates. So there've been, and and they and they and they also practice Islam. There's tons and tons of Arabic references, Arabic all around them. And over the past at least thirteen hundred years, possibly up to seventeen hundred years or more, they've been the language has been evolving and in constant communication with all these different people, different South Semitic languages and possibly Aramaic even. And so the language has taken the trilateral and the, I don't know about quadrilateral, but it's taken the trilateral verb system from Arabic, which is basically like saying, so in, in Maltese, which is, it basically is another neo Arabic variety. So in Maltese, which is like I said, that's my reference to the Arabic language here. So you have like, K, you have ka lam mim, K L M, that means to speak, or to talk. So you so you can put different you know you can put different vowels in between the K L and M or different or different consonants before it. You know um, you can and you can and off of those you can derive new nouns, new adverbs, adjectives, past participles which can be used for adjectives that in. You can form new nouns from them. It, it's 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 a pretty complex system, but that's basically what has happened in the Kumzari language, but not entirely. Like I haven't seen any examples of like putting the M, putting like the M and the the M O U version, uh, the M O U form to create. You know, like you know, like saying uh, like Rama means to throw something away, but more to me is thrown away. You know, I haven't seen anything like that. Um, but what ha but what they do have is, you know, a reclining camel. So jam um, jamal e rahama, a reclining camel. So this rahama, I, there are words in this language which, um, which I believe you'll see in the next slide on the second ver on the second page of D verbs. You can use this as, you know, reclining. You can use it as a sort of adjective which is a verb. You know, so you know, like for example, in Maltese. You might you might say Yenahiraj Yenahiraj Milbini. I'm coming. I'm going out of the building. So Hiraj is is a version of that D of that D verb, which is from Haraj. You know, you could say Nohraj or Ahraj in Arabic, or rather Ahraj in Arabic, to mean that you are coming out, or like I come out. But but many people who use who use these these forms in their everyday and everyday dialects and everyday Aamiya, they're going to be using this um, this form like Rahama. So Jamal e Rahama, a reclining camel. So you know um, Rahama here. So that that's one example, and then you can turn it into a noun. So these are examples. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where Araya is. I'm not, I'm assuming it's Arabic. I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm not familiar with this lexeme. Or word, but um, that means chattered or chattering, and then you have aryit, a chatterer, or sorry, a chatter, excuse me, and then 
Argentino, the chatterer. So here in the second version, uh, the verbs can also be turned into adjectives and adverbs, as I mentioned earlier. So you have adjectives here. So you have habaka, habaka, pierce or to pierce. And then you have hop, holy. And you have, and then it can be turned into an adverb. There are there are other examples, but this is generally done by take by removing the last vowel off of the main d verb, or for me it's just a normal verb in Arabic. You take that final one off, and then you add et with two long e vowels to express adverbs. So I put word, I put war, I put word here in green. Because that's more or less an adverb, like afterward, you know, and it could also be like the L-Y as well. So examples of the language's mixed nature. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, you've, you've seen sentences all throughout this video and examples that use Arabic lexemes. You saw, you saw the word list at the very beginning of the video that used, that demonstrated all these different words that they, that, that Kum's already has taken has taken words from, you know, like Shihi Arabic and and him and him Yarebic and Middle Persian, Jabali, Mahri, Hindu Hindi Urdu, and all kinds of other languages. So I just wanted to show an example of two sentences that I thought were great because they have both they they demonstrate both Indo Iranian vocabulary and Arabic derived vocabulary. So here in this first sentence you have they were not royalty, they were common. Referring to some people. So the word here, sheikh, uh, which obviously comes from the word sheikh, sheikh, or uh, royalty, which is how this is being translated. So I just put slash royalty here. And then you have, this is the uh, particle for the third person plural. And then you have the negative. And you have the subject. I guess this marks the subject that they weren't royalty. So royalty they are not royalty as one. And then you have Adi. Adi is from Arabic, just like Sheikh is from Arabic. So, and that means normal, which I believe is from the word oddly, oddly, something like that. And then you have, again, the third person plural. So this is a good example because it's it's got Indo-Iranian things in there like na, in, you know, the subject, mar the subject marker ah, and then you've got Arabic words and, and, you know, basically Arabic words thrown in here, or rather Arabo Kumzari words. And then the second example, you have, uh, you have Tamna, which is evidential. So this is just, this is just saying that Tamna is saying that it, it's evident it was there. It was there. It was obviously, it was obviously present. And then you have the, the subject, the subject marker here. And then you have uh, a camel. The indefinite article, and then you have this D verb, Rahama. And uh, just a quick note about this. So, um, whenever you have a sentence, for example, uh, the word falage, falage, eh, it is a wire channel. Eh, eh is, is, the, is the definite article. You can, or sorry, falage, oh. So, you, that, that just means it is, it is a wire channel. So you can just say the water channel, essentially just say the water channel and have nothing there, which is what this O, this striked out O is. If you have a sentence that just has that, it can mean it is the blah, blah, or he, she, it is the blah, blah, something like that. And then you have the preposition in, in the, which kind of reminds me of in the, in, in, in the, in, in dialect. And then you have Hawi. Courtyard, and this is an Arabic word. So, you know, you have Rahama, you have Jamal, you have Hawi, and then you have Yeh. And then you have this Indo-Iranian, I assume it's Indo-Iranian word Tamna. So, like I said, you, you see different, you, you can see it's mixed nature through these sentences. And just something to add before we get to uh, to uh, to the next um, next part of this video the bonus, so this is just a bonus note. Uh, I originally wasn't going to add this to the video, but I just, but then I saw this example and I thought it was fascinating, and I, th I was even more fascinated because, oh my god, it's garm. This has to be, re this has to be distantly related to the English word warm. And in Persian, in modern day Farsi, the word bad means English is bad, but they are from two completely different 
uh, they have two completely different derivations, and they're not they they just happened they happen to be phonetically similar, but they are not from the same they are not of the same origin. This is not the, this is not the same case. This is this is an Indo-European word because this exi- this exists in Germanic languages. You know, I know it exists in Dutch. I think German has a version of this word as well. But Garm, th- I mean, come on, I mean, this has to be Indo-European. So I thought this was really fascinating. So I wanted to share this, and because we, I never shared anything about nouns. Here we go. So the noun, the noun garb means heat, and you can see different forms here. I've marked, uh, I marked it in red because you know heat, hot. <laughs> um, and uh, I, so you can say you know the heat garmol garm tar hother garb. I'm not sure this g, what this g is. Um, just adjective for hot, and then you have hotness. And then you have this other one. They are hot, existential clinic, clinic. and then garman, hot weather, abstract plural form. And then you have garmiti, hotly. I don't know who, I don't know how you would say, how you would use that, but that's beyond me. All right. So I decided, um, I decided to do something cool with this because there are some terms from Anombi's work, which they derived certain lexemes from that list from English. So I decided that we could play a game with it. So, uh, so what you're, so what I'm going to do is go through some words in English and I want you to try to guess what those words mean. And in the next slide after that, I'll show you what, I'll show you what they actually mean in English. They're not going to be exactly the same, but they will be pretty similar. So, the kun- so the first one we have here is plin. This one, this one's gonna. This one isn't as straightforward as some of these other ones, but um, but I'll give you a few seconds to think of what that one might be. Um, okay, and the second one. So this one, this one's probably gonna be pretty easy for many people. You know, it sounds like. You know, somebody could easily say the word like that. Possibly, I could see that anyway. So this one, it has two meanings, which are pretty similar. They they, they express the they express a similar state of mind. And then this one, this one is probably going to be a little bit harder because the vowels are different. But it's not it's not it's not too too difficult. And then niglis. So this one, this one will probably stick out like a sore thumb to some of you. To me, to me, it 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 it, it kind of sort of did, but not really. And then this next one, this one is not going to be that straightforward. Kind of like pling. And uh, this is not. Yeah, this is not Bambi. Sorry. So this one, this one is going to be a little bit interesting because it looks very similar to uh, another English word, but it's missing, but it's missing a certain consonant at the very beginning of the word after the F. So this one might be, this one will probably be pretty obvious to many of you because it's, I mean, once you have that, once you figure out what that consonant is, you're going to know what the word is. And then this one is extremely interesting because it comes from a certain English word, but it's slightly changed meaning to something still relatively similar. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and reveal what these are. So here we go. So the first one, pling, it's not exactly, it's not exactly uh, that, like I said, it's not exactly straightforward, but it comes from the English word for plank, meaning like a plank of wood, a piece like a piece like a piece of wood. Like if you, if you've ever seen the '90s show, uh, the '90s American show, Ed, Dad, and Eddie, uh, one of the I forgot what the guy's name is, but he has this he has this wooden plank like a part of a fence that, it, and he make it's like an imaginary friend. It's got like a little eye. Um, if you've seen that on Cartoon Network, that's kind of what a plank is. For those of you who aren't familiar with the word, and uh, and then the second one, yes, it comes from the word upset. But it also means angry as well. 
I'm sure they I'm sure they've gotten into Iranian or Arabic word for this as well in the language. And then this one, like I said, Shawid comes from shovel. The uh and the a kind of throw off throw it off some. And then this one, so if you got necklace, you're half of the way there. But it's it's specifically a gold necklace. And then this one, bumpo. So a bumpy. Uh, I, I definitely didn't I definitely wouldn't have derived this from English. Um I mean if I knew if I saw what I meant bumpy, I would have said, oh, okay, that makes sense, but I don't know how E became O, just like how I don't understand how uh became A. But that one makes a little bit more sense actually. And then this one, um if you got freezer, absolutely correct. This one, Fezar, Fezar. Uh so you know. And then this one, uh, it has come to mean perfume, and it's from the English word for lotion. So, interesting. Um, I, just thought, I thought this would be an interesting little game to play at the end here. So, yeah. So, the question that I have for you before we end this video is, if you speak an Indo-Iranian language, such as Luri or Farsi Tajik, Dari or you know baluchi kurdish or one of the versions of kurdish or you speak you know any of these other uh indo-iranian languages or ones that are spoken in that region that are kind of similar but a little bit further distant or even if you speak a setting what how similar is kumzari to the one that you speak or if you've studied an indo-iranian language how similar is it to the one that you have studied and also to those of you who've never who've never studied an Indo-Iranian language, what do you think of the mixed nature of the language? Do you find it does it remind you of Maltese? Does it remind you of how English has taken in many words or other similar other similar mixed languages that have taken in elements of many other languages? And do you find it unique? Uh, I just want to thank everybody for watching this video. I was trying to find a word for thank you in Kumzari, but I couldn't locate it. So thank you all for watching. Gracias. Um, if you liked the video, please, please, please give this video a thumbs up so it get get out to more people. I'm trying to build this channel up. I'm trying to bring more people here. I want to spread. I want to spread the. I want to spread knowledge of rare languages, rare and unknown languages to the entire world. So if you could spread this video, share it, share it with your friends and your family, with your linguists, with your university, whoever, just share it with everybody that you can. I would greatly appreciate that, and that would be the biggest show of support you could give me. Thank you, and. Uh, link, later I will so, I mean, subscribe for more language related and you know whenever I can finally travel again um, uh, I will put up more travel content so thank you all for watching have a fantastic day